All right, everybody, come on in, grab your virtual seat. Sorry we had to keep you waiting at the door there for a few extra minutes. We had a technical difficulty, and it is resolved. So if you're here in the right place, welcome for another presentation of the online Cold Fusion Meetup. I'm Charlie Earhart, and I'll be your host for the next hour or so. And in this edition of the Meetup, our 297th, being recorded on Thursday, June 23rd, 2022, at noon U.S. Eastern Time, we've got Gavin Pickin back. Thank you, Gavin. Welcome back. And this time he'll be talking about how to find, install, and implement third-party libraries in CFML. And before we turn it over to him, let me just remind you the things you see at the bottom of the screen there. Um, if you want to tell people about the group, the URL is just easily remembered as coldfusionmeetup.com. That redirects to the meetup site. And the recordings, every session is recorded going back to 2007. And uh, they're all listed at recordings, plural, recordings.coldfusionmeetup.com. And that also redirects to a page on the meetup site. And then if you're interested in presenting, we'd love to have you. Gavin and I are happy to do talks. I'm probably going to do the next one. And Gavin's got already ones planned. And um, But if we'd love to have other speakers. And if you'd like to learn more about it, you know, it's pretty straightforward. But if you want to read about it at all, just go to speak.coldfusionmeetup.com. And that redirects to our blog post I did where I explain this stuff in more detail. All right. So with that, let's turn it over to Gavin. Take it away, sir. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. I should know better, but I don't. And uh, technical difficulties, my fault. Sorry about that. Uh, Try to do something with my camera right before the, the session started. But uh, anyway, we're here. We're going. And uh, we're going to walk you through. Right. So how to find, install, and implement third-party libraries in ColdFusion CFML. And obviously, Charlie's already done the intro. So thanks again, Charlie, for having me. OK, so who am I? Uh, I'm a software consultant for Order Solutions. I work with Coldbox, Commandbox, basically every single box every single day. Uh, I've been working with ColdFusion for 22 years, maybe a little longer, actually, uh, working with JavaScript for just as long. Um, I love learning and sharing uh, those lessons that I've learned. And that's why I'm here so often. I'm from New Zealand. I live in Bakersfield, California. I've got a loving wife, lots of kids, and countless critters. You can find me at gpickin on Twitter and uh, blog quite a lot on autosolutions.com as well. And you can also see me on the Modernizer Die CFML News Edition podcast. We do one every week. Uh, we stream live on YouTube, so you guys can join us and heckle us from the chat. Uh, it's pretty fun. Charlie's there a lot. Uh, and we try and share news and events and updates and conferences and all the good stuff you need from the CFML news. Uh, so if you want to keep up on what's going on in the CFML community. It's a great place to come get some content and have some fun. It's pretty relaxed, but uh, we, we share a lot of good stuff. We also, uh, you'll see me on CFCast quite a bit too. So I've been working through the Publisher First Forgebox package, which is related to the series that have, uh, talks I've been doing. And also for the podcast, we actually have a Forgebox module of the week and a VS Code hint, tip and trick of the week where we go over some extensions and stuff. And so we took those out of the podcast and made little videos of them so you guys can watch them on there. These are all free. Uh, there is some paid content too, but it's, uh, it's got a lot of free content on cfcast.com. Uh, cool little tra video training system. Uh, I'll be speaking at Adobe Developer Week in a, a few weeks' time um, about building Spar Android Windows apps with Vue.js and ColdFusion APIs. Um, and so check that out. It's free to register, so go do that. Charlie will be speaking there too, and lots of other great community speakers. And Into the Box in 2022 is going to be in Houston in September, so we have a, a great conference planned. We've actually got two tracks, two days. We have workshops the day before, and we even have a pre-conference track now, which is going to be some uh, great speakers from the community. Uh, so we got basically three tracks of content, like 38 sessions, I think, total. So tons of great stuff, um, and we hope we can see you guys there. Um, we do have some early bird pricing. It's June 31st for Into the Box. Um, and again, that pre-conference is, is pretty cool. So a lot of people that can't make it to the, the conference are still going to be presenting there. So we've got some pretty great names. Charlie's going to be speaking, Mark Takata, Ray Camden, Kai Koenig. A lot of great speakers will be speaking at the pre-conference, as well as a lot of great speakers at the conference itself. And I have a workshop there about Vue.js by our mobile apps. Um, into the box.org, you can find out more about that. Um, yeah. And CF Summit, um, I will be speaking. Speaking, hopefully, I haven't uh, submitted all my talks yet. They're, the submissions are open for a few more days. So if you want to speak at CF Summit, you can still do that. But hopefully I'll be there speaking. If not, I'll be there anyway. So I'll catch you there. 
Okay, so Charlie says, I've been here a bit. So we've had a few sort of videos in the series. And so on May 12th, I talked about code reuse in Cold Fusion. Is spaghetti code still spaghetti if it's dry? And then a follow-up one was, when should I use third-party libraries versus roll my own? And so this session just basically builds on top of these. You don't have to see these two first, but if you want to go back and watch them, you could. So this one led me to, where do we find third-party libraries? So um, basically... Most of the code will find the third-party libraries through Cold Fusion. <laughs> Most people find it through Google. You know, you might find a blog post, a presentation, Stack Overflow questions, and sometimes community forums. Uh, maybe you'll find them up on Slack or Twitter if people are, uh, you know, sharing a little bits there, tidbits here and there. Uh, you might find it on a napkin uh, written somewhere, scribbled down. Um, but basically, uh, hopefully, you'll see someone with a problem on one of those places, and hopefully someone uh, will give a solution that you can use. So that's sort of the best way for us to find stuff on third-party libraries out and about. Uh, I mean, you guys have probably done it over time. Hopefully, these presentations and stuff, uh, you know, ring a bell and, and help you find a solution. So where do you actually get those third-party libraries? So Forgebox, it's an, it's an Autist tool, but it's not just for box products. So I just want to make sure that we're clear about that because it's one of the most misunderstood things in the CFML community is just because it got box in the name doesn't mean you have to use cold box. Doesn't mean you have to use all the boxes. But Forgebox is the only full package management solution for your Cold Fusion applications, accessible from the CLI with command box, but you can also access it from the browser at forgebox.io. So I do work for Autis. We built it. I am biased, but I believe it's for a good reason. And uh, a little bit of this session, we'll talk about it, but not everything. There's other stuff too. I'm not just trying to sell you on Forgebox. So other places you can get it. So CFLib, this is an oldie, but a goodie. It's not updated very often. I think the last update was about six years ago, but a lot of these functions um, that were really good uh, and still relevant were being migrated over to Forgebox as well. But basically uh, taken from their site, there, it's a common function library project uh, the purpose was to create user-defined function libraries for Cold Fusion 5 and higher. And yes, some of these go way back to Cold Fusion 5. These libraries are for uh, you know open source and can be modified to your liking. Functions range from like, email formatting, encryption routines, um, and you know third-party libraries as we mentioned before. If you, you know they can greatly speed up your development time, and add new and powerful features to your site. And in the last session, we talked about different pros and cons from third-party libraries, but speed and, you know, using experience that you might not have, those are some big pluses. And so CFLib is a great place to, to get some code. GitHub. A lot of people post their GIFs or uh, repositories on GitHub, and then they share those links via blogs, tweets, forum posts, Slack, etc. I'm sure most of you probably heard of Ben Nadal, and he has a lot of code on his blog. He's been blogging for years, and he has a lot of uh, repos up there. He also has a lot of GIFs. He has 3,126 GIFs, 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 whatever you want to call them, um, but there's a ton of code up there. So that's another place you can find code. Um, and then I didn't mention Stack Overflow because obviously we assume that you know how to copy and paste from there, but there's also things like Java, you know, obviously Cold Fusion is built on top of Java. And so we can tap into Java stuff. Um, that's one of the strengths of CFML. And so Apache Maven is basically the package manager project management system for Java stuff. So um, if you're looking at, um, you know, different libraries or tools, sometimes CFML doesn't have it, or maybe there's a better way if you drop down to Java, you know, get closer to the bare middle, um, a Maven's a good place to, to look there. Um, and so there's a lot of things that you're probably already using. You may not even know is throwing uh, Java under the hood, um, but Maven's a good place for it. But Maven's primary goal is to allow a developer to comprehend a complete state of development in the shortest period of time. And so they try to help make the build processes easy, providing a uniform build system, providing quality project information, and carrying, encouraging better development practices. And so they're, you know, it's a package management system, but they're also trying to help with those other things. And most good package management systems do try to, you know, sort of solve these, these four concerns. Okay, so now we've found them. So how do we update them, right? How do we, how do we install these libraries? And so back in the old days, right, what we used to do is we used to manually install the library. So we would copy and paste from Stack Overflow, or if Ben Nadal wrote a blog post, we'd copy it and throw it in our code and would try to maybe put a link in there to see where we got it from or a little note. 
Uh, if you go to CF lib, you'll see a lot of times the code has, uh, you know, lots of comments above it. So you may have those CFML files in your app that, you know, it's got basically 300 lines of comments and maybe three lines of code. And that's all from, you know, one of those type of libraries. So we used to manually install the library. Um, next sort of step up, we may automate installing the library and make it easier for us from different ways. Maybe we'll use a package manager. So let's look at that a little bit more. So manually installing the libraries. So you got to find the library you want to install. Then you want to download the files. Then you got to figure out where do you put them? You know, do you just throw them in your app? Um, do you put them in, you know, a certain folder or do you just copy and paste them into the, the CFM file that you're actually writing it for or using it for, you know? Um, so you got to figure out how you want to implement them and, you know, thinking long-term about main, maintainability, you got to think about that and, and make it easy for you to, to handle it later. And then how do you know when you need to update them? So maybe Ben Nadell wrote a great blog post and has this thing. And then someone in one of the comments uh, mentions he's got a big hole in this code. You copied the code. You didn't copy the one from the updated page. So now maybe there's a big security hole in that and you've got to go fix it. Not pointing fingers at Ben, it's just a good example. You know, blog post code, it changes over time, right? People will update it and tweak it. And unless you know to go back and find it, then you won't even know it's needed to be updated. How do you update them? Well, probably got to go remember to where the blog was, go find it, see if there's been any updates, copy that code, and then put it wherever you need to. And then how do you deploy them? So, like, if it's in your code, obviously you deploy your code, it'll go with it. But there's other ways to install your code, too. Maybe you want to put them in a shared repo. Uh, you want to put them somewhere in a shared folder that other apps and whatever might use as well. So sometimes this deployment can be a little trickier. So basically, that sort of comes down to the question, like, where do you actually put them? So do you put them in your source control repository? Now, one of the things is, is if you're using a big library, maybe you're using one of the, the Java libraries, right? So if you've ever used the Amazon SDK for working with AWS services, it's huge. So if you put this in your repo, you're adding a huge number of files, huge size of files, and now you've just bloated your source control repository, right? So now every time you update that library, Every time you change those files, which, you know, usually if there's an update, most of those files are going to change. You're going to have 10, 50, hundreds of files all change in your source control repo. So in your commit log, you're going to have just a, a huge lot of noise. It could bloat your current repo size. And right now when you install, right, you're cloning from, from Git or something like that, you clone down the version, right? Your code is pretty big from that. But what you don't realize and what you might not realize is when you do a clone, it grabs like the 10 or 20 different uh, historic versions of your site, like the last 20 commits when you clone something. Uh, and so when you actually pull it down, you're pulling down the last 20 versions. And so you've up updated the Amazon AWS SDK a few times, you could have like a gig of stuff in your repo. Your code might only be like 300 kilobytes, but all your dependencies, if you're in your source control, now they're there too. And so your current repo size for like what you install from the latest master or main or whatnot, uh, might be big, but when you pull down that repo, it's got the history. The history is bloated too, and that's a, a pretty big, a pretty big deal. And again, uh, how do you know when to update them? So, if you've got a, got to know which version you have. So, when you copied that blog post, did you write the exact version that it was? Did you know the date that it was posted or updated? Do you have, you know, do you know if the code is the same? And do you know what version is the latest? So. Uh, if it's on Stack Overflow and someone tweaked it, do you know if there's a better version of the code you have? Is there something safer, more secure? Um, it's kind of hard to, to keep track of, right? And then do you remember where to go find it? You know, like if you need to go look for an update, if you have 20 or 30 of these, that's going to be a lot of work. Do you check every week, every month, you know, twice a year? How do you How do you know where to go? And if someone does update a security patch, will you find out about it? Um, are you on an email list? Are you, you know, like how, how do you know that something is out there? Um, so there's all these things to think about when manually install, installing third party libraries. So then you get down to the question, how do you update them? You know, so you've got that, uh, you got the code, you need, you know, you know, you need to update it. So now you have to find where your code lives now. You know, do you remember where you put it? Uh, do you remember the steps you used to install it? 
you might have to determine how to install the last version. You know, maybe the last version did things and you had to load some, uh, you know, CFX files in your Windows ColdFusion administrator. You had to put these three jars in this folder, um, you know. So sometimes these are really complicated and you have to remember what you did. And sometimes you're like, wait, is this the only thing that uses this? Is something else going to break if I change it? You know, so uninstalling things might get a little more complicated. Where do you put the new version, you know? And then when you do update, how do you, how do you know that the your other devs have the right version? Because if you've done it on your local machine, you're doing local development, you've changed your stuff, how do they how do they know that they have to change theirs? You know, who's the one that updates staging and production? Um, and if you do deploy code, how do you know it's going to go at the right time, right? If you put it in source control, um, you know, do you handle the bloat? Do you squish some commits or something? And then so when you go out and deploy, um, you know, if your code is in source control, um, it's easy to get out to the devs because they just pull the code and it gets there, right? Staging production the same. But again, we talked about that bloat problem. So maybe you're going to avoid that. So you're going to use a shared folder or something like that. But then how do the devs get all that version of that library? And how do they get it when they need it? Because if you change your code, like your library, you might need to change some of your code. And so if the devs just get that folder because, you know, it's in a shared folder somewhere, maybe their version of the code is going to break now because it's, it's not in sync. You know, how do you update staging? How do you update production, but not before the code that needs it gets there? Because if you push the code too soon, it's going to break because the wrong library is there. If you push it too late, the library is not going to be there. Um, you know, or the library gets there too soon. There's all these headaches, right? Manually managing this stuff is a headache. It's a nightmare. And, you know, so it's it's a big problem. But we've done it for years, right? Is it really that bad? And sometimes, no, it's not. But yes, it can be that bad if you have multiple developers or you have multiple deployment tiers or too many libraries to keep track of or if you have no here left after managing your nightmare lib folder manually. And so... That's the reason why people built other ways to do this, right? Because these are the pain points. And maybe your app is fine. You've got three bits of code from Ben and one from Stack Overflow, and that's all your app needs. This isn't going to be the same problem for you as someone that has multiple developers and multiple tiers and tons and tons of libraries, right? So, and it's different too, because some people work on one app all the time and maybe have only one app to worry about, but other other people work on 50 apps, right? Or they work on 500 client apps, and, and this type of stuff gets exponentially crazier when you start you know, looking at scale. So we could automatically install these third-party libraries, right? So maybe we'll use a tool or script to handle installing from things like a URL link. Maybe we'll hit a Git repo to pull something. Uh, we could pull stuff down from S3 or CFLib or GIST or you know Java. So we could write a tool or use you know a script to do something like this. So we can try to automate it somewhat. But when you do something like that, does the tool know which version of the library you have? Does it know which version of, of that you need of the library? Uh, does it know if that library is going to break things? Do you already have that version installed? And how do you uninstall the old library? So if you're building something from scratch, you know, I know people have, you have to sort of take some of these things into consideration. And again, when you update versions of the library, does the tool know, uh, you know, what to do? And do you have to update the tool? If it's a script in your repo, maybe you've got a folder called, you know, at Autis, we have a workbench folder. We have scripts in there that do certain things, but... Um, if I'm changing the version, now I've got to change that script wherever it needs to be. So I have to update it for all the divs. I have to update it for staging, production. Um, where do you keep your tool? How do you maintain your tool? Is it you know a tool that's shared between many apps, or is it just in each app? Is each app different? Um, and then you need to keep track of which version is needed for what code, right? And then we get back to the whole problem is like, when I push my code to production, is the right version of that library going to be there? So these are things you need to think about. And so... If your libraries are installed from multiple sources, can your tool handle all those different options, like a URL link or a Git repo or S3 or CFLib or GIST or Java? Don't know how to install them from those places because they're all, usually when you get this stuff, they're all over the place. And then doesn't know where to install them. So doesn't know how to install them. So now we decided a tool is better than manual. Do you write it in a CFML script that does it? Do you write a bash script? 
Do you write a GitLab or GitHub action or Jenkins job or Travis job or PowerShell or make files? Yep, I'm talking to you, Adam Tuttle. I heard you talking about make files in your in the podcast. But these are all different ways you can do it, right? And just another plug here, but you know, Forgebox can install things from endpoints other than Forgebox. So Command Box, sorry, did I say Forgebox twice? Command Box can install things from other endpoints other than Forgebox. So do you need to make a tool that does all this? There's a tool that does it, and you don't have to use Forgebox for this. You can still install from a lot of different places, and uh, that might be something worthwhile, right? Instead of writing your own scripts or maintaining Bash, I hate Bash. I don't want to write Bash. Or Jenkins, how do you know how to trigger it? You know, then you got to maintain a Jenkins server too. It's starting to get pretty crazy. So Command Box. Uh, a lot of you probably have heard of Command Box, but I bet you don't know all the things it can do because Command Box is, is pretty interesting. It started off as a little project as a CLI tool, but it does a lot of things. So again, it's a CLI tool. So it's basically a, a terminal with superpowers. And one of the cool things I like about it is if I'm on Windows, I can do stuff like grip in Command Box. If I'm on Mac, I can do stuff like DIR because it basically has a, all these aliases for these cross-platform helpers. And so if your Windows CLI sucks, opening up Command Box, it's actually a lot better because not only can you script in it, but it just has all those helpers. So CLI. It also does package management. And so we're going to look at some of this stuff today, looking at different endpoints. It can also scaffold out an application so you can install templates. And remember, not just command box, box stuff. Uh, see if Wheels is using it. Framework One has some scaffolding. There's other stuff out there which is not, you know, box products that can use command box. And the application scaffolding, et cetera, is a good example of that. Most people know it for embedded servers. If you want to start locally, uh, Adobe a server or a Lucy server, or you can actually start, you know, any jar file, but not sorry, any jar, any wire file. Basically, um, you can run uh, as an embedded server. You can actually run an HTML server too without any uh, engine as well. It's pretty neat. And the th cool thing is, you can pick your version. So you could run Lucy 5.3 on one of them, and Lucy 5.1 on another, and you could run Adobe 2019, uh, 2018 on one project, and uh, Adobe 2021 on another project, and you don't have to do any craziness. It'll handle it all for you. Uh, and if they do an update, you change the version, and away you go. Task runners. You can actually write task runners and bash scripts and all these different cool things in ColdFusion now. And you can even have a, a bash dot, like a, a file dot sh, and actually have a little thing at the top of it that tells it this is a command box bash script, and you can write CFML in the script. It's pretty cool when you're doing uh, build automations and stuff like that. And then it's modular and extensible with CFML. So you can make your own CFML modules. There's a whole bunch of uh, things like CF Wheels just had their CF Wheels CLI go 1.0. And it's basically a module you install in Command Box. And it uses Command Box to do all this crazy cool stuff for CF Wheels. And again, Cold Box is what I use, but CF Wheels is another framework. And they're using Command Box and Forge Box to make their uh, framework better. So, anyway. So, Command Box. We can install from lots of different endpoints, right? For Command Box to install packages for you, it needs to know where to connect to them. So we do need to give it a little bit of information. But um, the cool thing is it actually ties into a lot of different things, right? So it obviously, it integrates seamlessly with ForgeBox because we made them together to work together. Um, and that has basically all sorts of crazy Cold Fusion projects. Um, it's a recommended endpoint for all this, and we'll tell you why. But uh, it has let's see if wheel stuff and framework one it's got you know themes for for different projects it's got application scaffolding forge box has little libraries like cf lib it has all sorts of stuff um but command box can also integrate with many other endpoints to use with cfml and java and that's what we're going to look at so http so you can point to a zip file containing a package um pretty much anywhere right so if you have an http http or https link you can tell command box to install it and it'll go install that for you and keep track of it for you too which is a benefit file it can uh basically a local file containing a package so like a zip file somewhere and maybe you've got a shared folder somewhere and all your apps can you know basically refer to this utils.zip and it can install that uh, a, a folder so if you maybe you have a folder which has a whole bunch of uh whole bunch of stuff in it and again a shared folder so all your devs can get to it or maybe there's a you know shared location um, so you could use that if you have uh, a NAS drive or something that you want to share you could use it through a folder a git repo so a git repo um, that contains you know 
they see a package or a zip or, or whatnot. Um, so that works great with that. And then we have uh, Lucy extensions. So hosted via HTTP. Um, it's not contained in a zip file. So if you run Lucy, you can actually write your own extension. So you could write that or use a third party library. There's quite a few cool ones out there. Uh, Autos has quite a few. Um, okay, sorry. Apparently I got going a little too fast. <laughs> uh, and then S3 um, is also a package zip. So if I have a, an S3 pack, uh, sorry, S3 bucket, I can store my code there too. So maybe if you're installing it uh, locally, but then when you go to staging production, you might have a, a zip file and you can put it in S3 because you know you get all the, the cloud front uh, benefits, et cetera. So you could do that too. And you can use private buckets, not just public buckets. So command box has a way to, when it's talking to S3, to use some credentials you can store um, in your system. And then CFLib. So we talked about CFLib. Let me actually open that up real quick and I'll show you. So again, it is a little older site, but uh, there's, uh, you know, date library stuff. We've got network library. We've got math library security. So if we go over to like, let's go to the networking. So we can get host names. We can look at, you know, IP dot decimal to IP address, uh, IP class, IP convert. There's a bunch of different things. And if you go look at one of them, it'll give you like the little description. You can see the code, you know, like example. You can actually copy the code right here. Um, or you can try and, you know, basically download it through for an up, through our methods. Um, a GIST, we also um, mentioned that you can get it as a GIST from gist.github.com. So if we open that up here, if we look on here, you'll see that these are some of my GIST. So I've got one here for uh, a, a util for using Amazon Web Services uh, Signature 4 utility for Cold Fusion. This is an alpha and I forked it from somebody else. Uh, so this GIST is something. And so, you know, you can copy paste this, but obviously if we make changes to this, you probably want a, a more recent version. And you can see revisions here for even for a GIST or GIST, um, Java. So we can install OpenJDK for your server. So when you start your server up um, using cold few, uh, command box, you can also say, hey, I want Java 8, Java 11. I want to break my server. I'm going to use Java 17 or whatever. And then a jar file. So you can actually uh, use a jar file hosted via HTTP. That's not contained in a zip file. So a lot of these things are zips, but some things are not. So, but this is, you know, a lot of things that command box to do, can do. So let's try and open it up and actually try it out. So I'm going to pull up my little code editor here. And you'll be switching the screen. I'm just going to pull it over, but hey, while you're yeah. doing that, and I hopped in anyway, let me just say if you've wondered about that word G I S T, it actually is an English word, and it really is pronounced just. It, it isn't a technical thing or a, an acronym, so the 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 word is really just, just yeah, just. yeah. That's what I was thinking. The gist of things, right? But, exactly. Yeah. That's it, and that's yep. how it all came to be. Is it's the gist of a concept somebody wanted to communicate in code. That was where the notion came from. So there you go. Cool. So if I drag this over, you guys should better see my see code. Yep. Okay. So I got rid of a lot of this stuff here. Anyway, so I got a little dummy repo in here. So um, I'm going to just kill my box.json because I'm going to start fresh. But so basically, I got a little application CFC. I've got an index file, and I've got a couple of test libraries. Um, so I'm going to try and use CFLib and GIST and JAR. And so really simple. And we're going to look at some different ways to do this. So I'm going to start up command box real quick. Oops. And while I'm doing that, I'm going to jump back to the code, and we'll see some of the ways we can do that. So again, we mentioned you can point to an HTTPS endpoint. So if you point to a host zip file containing a package, um, you can install that. And so we've got this here. I didn't have the install in front of it. So I'm going to exit full screen real quick. And I'm just going to copy this in. Basically, this is zip file through Git. I'm just using that because it's easier than me getting code and putting it up somewhere on the server and, and playing around or whatever. So, but... So basically what I'm going to do is I'm going to have my little repo here. I've got my index file. I've got a couple other files. And so this, you can pretend this is my, my app, right? So what I'm going to do is try and install a few different things in here so we can use it. 
and um, I say command box is was starting up here. No, it says it was starting again. There it is. Must not have refreshed. Okay, so really weird. Okay, anyway, so if you go install and push dollar sign, you'll see that command box has lots of cool code and it even gives you a ton of examples in here um you know for all the different things you can you know install lots of different stuff but again this documentation is all available um online and everything else so what we're going to do here is basically use the install and the first item is going to be the endpoint right so you can choose an endpoint in this in the package if you don't put an endpoint it tries to figure it out uh, otherwise it'll look on forgebox for it because that's the default now you do have some options of telling it where you want to, you know, put it in. You can choose if you want to save it or not. And by default, command box is set up to save it in your box.json. So it keeps track of your dependencies for you. So this is a big plus over just writing your scripts yourself. Uh, and then you can choose, um, you know, different options. Save dev means that you only want it when you're installing development. And if you install in production, it won't actually install those dependencies. And then you can do th certain things like verbose and force and, and system and whatnot. So. Anyway, long story short, we're going to try and install this, this bcrypt module, okay? So we're going to hit the zip file. It's going to go out there, get the zip. It's going to pull it down. It's going to throw it in a folder. And because uh, this is actually a zip, it knows where to put it because it's got a box.json in it. So this box.json right here, uh, it tells it uh, command box, basically, you know, information about the package. So when it opens it, even though it's just a, a zip file, when we're not using Forgebox, it knows it's a module and Command Box knows how to install modules. So it puts it in its own modules folder with the name of the, the app as a folder and then it pulls the pieces in there. So that's what it did for us. And then it puts in the box that Jason for us too. So, hey, this is your dependency. This is where we got it from. And this is where we put it. It's kind of neat, right? I think that's pretty neat. Even if you're not using Forgebox, you want to use your own code, you can still do that. So let me put the install in here. Now, if I want to install my own little uh, zip file, I can just do install and then give them the folder for the zip. So I'm pretending that I've got like a NAS folder here with some stuff in it. So I'm going to install this SynGrid protocol, right? So I have the zip file and it's it's in my, my repos. It's meant to be like a pretend hidden folder, but you can use absolute um, directories. So C drive or slash or, or whatever, but I'm just going to do my repos. And then send grid dot zip. And so what it's going to do is just grab that zip file. It's going to uninstall it or install it. Sorry. And so because this again is a module inside of it, it has a box to JSON. So it knows where to put it. So again, even if they're using box to JSON stuff, but you're not using forge box, it's still a little smarter. Now, if I want to use a folder to install, I can actually install a folder. So I have a utils folder in, in here. So it's got other stuff, like it's got my mailgun validate module and everything else. So what I'm going to do here is I'm going to install my repos slash utils. And then whatever's in that utils folder, I could have a bunch of CFCs, some CFMs, just you, whatever you dump on that folder is fine. So when I install it here, what it's going to do it's going to go grab everything in that folder and install it. Now, because it was a folder, it wasn't a zip, it didn't look at this box.json because if it did, it would have found it's a module. And if it found it was a module, it would have put it in the right place for Coldbox has conventions that you put things under you know, modules from installed from external locations go under the modules folder so it can handle and you know maintain it. So now it's here. So what happens if I do uninstall my repos? utils didn't do anything right it's still there but if i uninstall well let's just go up a couple let's see if uninstall works on a zip did it remove it no so there's a few things it can't do because it's not quite the same as using a package manager. So it's an endpoint installer, but that's what you get. But on the next page here, we have a few more. So we can also install from uh, you know, a GitHub repo. So if you use install git, this is a, a module I have. So if we 
install from a Git repo. So this can be your repo and you can use SSH keys as well for your private repos if you have something private. Um, whoops, let me get rid of the second install here. Sorry, everybody. So what this does is it, it's just installing Git. It's going to go get that Git package. It figures out, okay, this is your, your branch. Branch is a zip. It's going to create it, whatever, install it. And again, because it installed it a certain way and it was a zip file because Git translates to zips, uh, it knows how to install it and puts it in the right folder. Okay, so what about this? If I want to install something from CFLib, I can just use the name of the, the UDF. Remember, we looked at this one here, Git host name. So that's the name of it here. So if I'm going to install it, I can use CFLib colon. That tells it, go look on CFLib for this. So if I try and install that, then it's going to install it. Doesn't know what to do with it, though, so it just shoves it in the top folder, right? It names this the, the package name, and then the CFM in front, inside of it, it throws it in here. But does it? And if we look at our box of JSON, whoops. You see, it's keeping track of this. It tells us where we got it from. You know, there's a folder. Uh, this is the, the CFLib. You know, obviously, some of these things won't transfer when you go from one site to another because you've got uh, locations that are hard coded for my machine, etc. We can also install a gist. Uh, a gist. Yeah, I keep saying that wrong. Anyway, so I'm going to install a gist here. So this is my gist. It's one of my gists that I've got. This is the one I talked about before. And you're like, where'd it go? It installed it. So where's my gist? Well, my gist is named that. Pretty terrible name, right? <laughs> that's where it installed it. This is a gist. If I come in here, you'll see that's the S, the, the SV4 um, util. So this one here, um, little utility. So that's one of my gist, gist. But there's another one here. So this is one from Ben and we'll see if this one works. You might see this one throws an ugly error. So why is that? So you see here, ref master cannot be resolved. So right now, uh, there's a ticket in for this because uh, I ran into it. But by default, um, in the old days, everything used master as the main branch, right? Unfortunately, um, that's changed, you know, obviously for good reasons and everything. Um, you know, basically most, most repos now start as the main as the branch. So if you want to install this, you have to actually do main to tell it what branch. And a lot of things in Git, you know, if you do hash something, you can do a tag or a version or, you know, lots of different stuff. But if you install that, now it finds it because Ben Nadell's one, um, it was actually under the main because it was more recent. So it defaulted to that. So he's got a little, you know, little thing in here for falsy that he wrote. Um, so, yeah, it's just, just a hint there. If something doesn't work the way you think it is, it's because right now it's defaulting to master. Uh, we're updating our code to check the repo to see if it has a master branch. If it doesn't, we're going to try main. But, of course, you could change your branch names to whatever you wanted. But if you put the hash on the end, then we know exactly which one you want. Okay. We also have some other things, too. So we can install from an S3 bucket. And, again, just use S3 colon, then your, your bucket, and then here. And again, there's documentation on how to add your credentials um, to your system. And then if we want to install a jar, so remember we installed the bcrypt module before. Maybe we don't want the bcrypt module. We just want the jar. So we can actually install this. And what it will do is it will actually go out. And again, it could just be a jar anywhere. It could be a jar in Maven, wherever you want to get it from. You can install that in here. Um, and because there's all sorts of weird characters, we had to put it in quotes just to, to make sure it worked. But basically, it goes out, it downloads that jar, and then it's going to shove it in a lib folder because jars go in lib folders, right? So that's where they go. So that's how you install some of these. So let me go back to my slideshow here. And we'll continue on. Now, we do have Lexus and Java options as well. So the Lex is basically in a server extension. So we have Autos Redis cache that you can get. Um, you could use the PDF forms. If you're using, using Lucy and you want some PDF form stuff that Adobe does that Lucy doesn't, we have a you know extension that you can install. And there's a lot of free extensions out there too. You can make your own extension. It's pretty easy. And it's pretty cool that you can write your own extension and then basically make your own library functions or basically native almost to, to Lucy. And then Java, um, you can obviously install whatever JDK you want. So you can use uh, you know a certain version 
with this if you want so you can install certain versions and then run your servers with that so other things you can do with it too okay so as i mentioned before um command box works best with forgebox because forgebox is a full cold fusion package management for your app it's the only full package management solution for cold fusion applications it's accessible from the cli and forgebox at, with your browser sorry you guys oh. well i was i was waiting to see where you were going to go next kind of feels like this is a, a demarcation back to the whole previous section of things you discussed something that wasn't clear and you might want to just help people to know for this yeah, sure. talk if they use any of those previous several techniques to do the install within command box and it modifies those code directories as we saw can you say to what degree if they then take that code and move it to a server that's not running command box but is like their test or qa or production server can you say which things could be reasonably expected to work and some that would not work like if you can quickly bring back your uh, vs code yeah sure show that folder at a minimum like that server json and the box json those aren't going to mean anything to a server that doesn't run command box yeah. but is there anything that's in them that's telling command box how to load things or where to find things so this just tells it, yeah so this just tells command box where things were got from and where to put them and so okay. what i can actually do is if i come in here and like i i delete something so maybe i'm not actually running uh you know so say you are using command box locally right but you don't want any of this in your repo so if i delete a bunch of stuff from in here the cool thing about command box is you just type install and it's going to make sure that you have all your dependencies. So if Charlie's working on the app and he adds something new, and then I pull down the code in the box that Jason changed, I just type install, and it's going to go install them all. Right. But you may notice that it's installing everything. It's installing everything again. So even though I already had it, it's installing it. And so that's where, you know, command box here, we're just using it as an installer. It's installing stuff. And the, the next piece I'm going to talk about is what makes package management with Forgebox different. And, you know, you'll see some of those benefits. But, yeah, so basically, if you don't want to use Command Box on your server or your build tool or whatever you have, um, you know, so some people, what they do is they don't put Command Box on their server. But in their build pipeline, they'll have their box.json, and all this stuff is excluded from their source repo. So in their build pipeline, they start up, you know, GitHub Actions. They do a box install. It gets all this stuff here, and then they FTP it to their server, or they async it to their server. And so that's how all those files get there. And so you don't have to command box on the server, but whatever you're, you know, wherever you're pushing to the server from, you should do a box install first. And again, if you want to put all these in your code, you can. But, you know, imagine, you know, like I said, that, that the SDK, I think, for the Amazon Web Services, AWS stuff, was like 500 megs or something ridiculous. It was huge, you know? So... You know, so if you have all that in your in your repo, you're gonna get bloated. But maybe you want to deal with bloat because at least you have a record of exactly what was there, and you don't have to worry about a version disappearing or someone deleting their blog post now, and that that thing that you got here from the zip is no longer available. You know, so there's pros and cons with everything. Don't get me wrong, but that's that's the way I would you know think it works. And like I said, so this I think is just you answered my question, and so you were more pointing out that the box JSON or the server JSON was just helping the install process to know where things stood. And I get that. And that's yep. cool. But for yep. example, that resulting live JB crypt that has that yep. JB crypt jar. Did you guys scaffold in somewhere the code that's leveraging it? Like, did you in the application CFC put in a this dot Java no. settings to point to it? No, at this point, we're using command box just to basically just to install it. Okay, that's cool. So yeah. I hear what you're saying. Yeah. So it's just installing it. You're not really putting any code in to call it. But I just want to clarify yeah. that if yeah. somebody did start calling it, for example, that jcrypt jar, they'd need some way for it to be findable by their yep. code. And that's and that's what we're going to know. Are you sure you guys aren't putting something into command box that says, oh, there's a jar here? You can yeah, find it here. You could, you could modify the class path yeah. for us, and it just works, and that's great. But then when we put that code on the server, it doesn't have that class path to find in the admin, 
and it doesn't yeah. work. So, no. Okay. no, we're right. not doing that. And then even normally with cold box apps, because we put stuff in a certain folder, cold box knows, Hey, modules, yes. these have cold modules. We, we yeah. will, cold box will loop through it. Command box doesn't do anything. It just helps get you there. And then we'll talk a little bit more about command box, forge box, what it does here. And then I'll show you how to implement these as well at the end. Uh, I know we're short on time, but uh, I'll, I'll, make, I'll stick around for those to watch and um, we'll, we'll make Thank it work. But yeah. So good question though, Charlie. So yeah. So again, um, Cold Fusion package management for your app. And again, I thought Charlie's going to come in and say, remember, Cold Fusion has a, a package manager for Cold Fusion Engine. So the CF, CFPM, which is with Adobe 21, uh, you have to basically install all the different modules of your engine. So that's why I said full Cold Fusion package management for your app, because it's different than the, the right. Cold Fusion package manager, which just handles, are you using RM? Do you need you know right. this or that? So yeah so that's what i thought you were gonna say charlie which i i did forget so no. you prompted me anyway <laughs> so yeah but okay so a lot of people they have a lot of reasons why they don't want to use package management and so these are some of the things that we hear a lot so you know why should i not use package management people say it's just another tool to, to deal and manage you know like it's, it's we already we've got enough right um the old school is simpler what about building without the internet? You know, like it's not going to work, right? Uh, and builds are faster if I don't have to worry about packaging stuff and, and dealing with that. So that's what we hear a lot, but this is what we say to them. Modern developers have lots of tools and this one will actually save you time and headaches. So we think it's the one tool you should be adding when maybe some other ones you may not want to. And old school is simpler. Um, and we're like, not when you have to manage your nightmare lib folder manually. And, you know, we've, we've seen a little bit of it and we talked about it earlier. So those are two reasons I, I don't think are valid. And again, each their own pros and cons, but that's that's our view. And so what about building without the Internet? Um, most package managers have offline modes, so they have ways to deal with things. Uh, we have we have agents, uh, customers that are government and I can't, I don't know if I can tell you who they are or not, but basically their servers, they have to walk code across the street on CDs and stuff like there's no connection at all. Everything's super locked down, but you know what they copy over? They copy over Forgebox artifacts and then they run box and store there. So they can still do that with offline modes. And people say builds are faster without packaging. I'm like offline and artifact based builds are very fast. And compared to cloning stuff and managing stuff, like they're actually a lot faster than you think. Um, so it's not like NPM node modules. We don't quite go that crazy. Yep. And then Scott's in the chat said third party. If you want a feature or update it, you can just make a pull request or fork it. It doesn't have, you know, if it doesn't fit the creator's model, uh, that's a good point. And the last station we talked about, you know, roll your own versus third party and stuff. And yeah, a lot of times we use open source, you can just fork it. So if, you know, a lot of times you have access to that code, even if the person stops developing it and, so it's a good point. So why should we use package management? Um, so knowing which libraries you use and which version is very important. Like, and we used a couple of these use cases before. If you need to update a library due to a critical bug or security hole, or you need to check to see if something that was announced even affects you, right? Also, if you can tell the version that you have is the most recent by reading the package information, you know, you have that package information. Some of the stuff that we downloaded has versions. Some of it has dates. Some of it has that, but a lot of it doesn't. Um, and the cool thing is, is you don't have to download the, the repo and zip every single time because you don't know which version that repo or zip has. So when we install from a zip file, we don't know. Is that the latest one? Is it the newest one? We have to pull it down and unpack it basically every single time because we don't know which version it is. And um, package managers, the cool thing is, you know that already because the Forgebox will tell you. And then we only download new versions if you haven't got it and if it's not in the artifacts because we actually keep artifacts locally. Oh, Anthony, uh, PR is a pull request. So that's a you know a request to merge some of your code into the, into the main branch. So you basically file a claim like in GitHub. You say, hey, I'm going to do a pull request for this code. You want to add some code to the repo and, and if someone like scott is running the repo he'll say hey yep i like your code i'm going to pull it into my pull it into the the third party library i'm going to pull it into my repo and so that's what the pull request is pr sometimes you'll hear them as mr merge request 
just depending on you know what style of uh, source control you're talking about. Okay, so moving on. Um, package management is like Forgebox of what Senva Raid News to, and we'll look at that if we have time. Um, the cool thing is it only installs the updates that you specify with a version in the package and the Senva range in your box to JSON, which is like a package to JSON. So you may say, you know what? I never want to go up from um, version four of something because version five changes the way something works and I don't want to update my code yet. You can just tell your box to JSON, yeah, I only want version four. Any version four is fine, no version five or more. So you can tell it, these are the ranges I want, or this is a specific version I want, and the package manager will honor that. So let's uh, open up VS Code, which we already have running here. So I'm going to start my server. And just to get this up and running, um, well, actually, let me go back here. So I'm going to install a few different things. Uh, and this will be package management style. Okay. So what I'm going to do real quick, though, Charlie, is I'm going to show you. I did throw this in here, this, this dot Java settings. And so when you start a server, because if you add this after we start it, uh, it does make a difference. But you can tell it, hey, uh, in my lib folder is where all my jars live. So if you add this list.java settings, um, you know, it'll basically make sure all those are added to your past settings. So mm -hmm. that's something that we just recommend you do. And then if you're installing um, from Maven and other places and you put things in your lib folder, then that will get that handled for you. And let's just throw out for people who may, you know, do something with something like a Java thing like this. In the old, prior to, I think it was CF10 that added this ability to do that, you would instead have to just know to put the jar in a particular live in Adobe's Cold Fusion class path, or in the administrator, there was a place to add a pointer to the folder. But this was a nice evolution to just do it in your application CFC. And then since then, Lucy has gone a step further and you can just in your create object or CF object call, you can name the path and CF has not yet adopted that. So yeah, this is the good way to yeah. do use of Java. And since we're talking about code reuse, it's a good opportunity to remind people of those three points. Yep, exactly. And so again, just wanted to show it quickly. So I'm going to stop my server now, but if you do install the Java library and add this after and you try to run it, you usually have to restart your server. So that's the reason I mentioned it right now. Uh, I didn't, because my machine shut down. Funny. I'm going to stop it. So. Sorry, everybody. So that start up here. So what we're going to do here, we're going to do a couple of different things. So we're going to install Coldbox 5.1 via a git zip. So we're going to use the install zip like we did before. Then we're going to install... Um, using Forgebox. So when you install Coldbox, Coldbox is uh, the name of the repo So in, on, uh, on Forgebox, and we can actually tell it which version we want. And so we're going to look at that. And then we're going to look at installing Coldbox at version 5, which is just very generic. Like, I want 5.x something. Sorry. And then we're going to look at updating dependencies too. So we're going to play with it a little bit and see sort of the difference between it. And so... Let's get back to our code here. Okay, so when you do install and you start typing code, it'll give you all the packages that you could actually install from Forgebox right here. So if we go code box, you see all the ones that have code box you know, starting the name. If we do this, we can see all the 5.0 versions. Um, so with Forgebox, like it, it managing your versions, it's tracking all this stuff. And if I bring up the browser here and we go to Forgebox, there's a lot of different packages here. We, you know, we talked about a lot of different categories. There's, you know, engines are stored there. Um, we've got command box commands. We've got content box themes. We've got Lucy extensions, messaging queues, MVC stuff. We've got stuff for Preside, tons of stuff in here. If you want to work with JWTs, Jots, we got stuff for that. But we're talking about Coldbox right now. So let's look at Coldbox here. When we pull up this module, See that the most recent version is 6.7. But when we go to versions here, you'll see that there's just a ton of them. And so it keeps track of all the different versions, where they are, if they were stable or not, when they were released. So you've got a lot of information in there. So I want to install a certain version, right? So if I was going to do it old school way and try to use command box still, I could actually do it with a zip. 
So when we release our modules, we tag them with a version number. So at least we know which version it is instead of just being coldbox.zip and you got to guess every time you download it, right? Or if someone just re-uploads the same thing, you get in your way. Uh, and so if they just change coldbox.zip to the new version, instead of 5 point something like I want now, it might actually install, um, you know, like 6.7, which is the latest. And it could break something if you're not ready for it. So here I'm telling it, this is the version I want. Okay, so I'm going to pull it down. It's going to install it. It's decompressing it. It's looking at the box.json, it's checking the dependencies. Uh, and actually, a lot of times, it's smart enough with this here to go and figure out, does this box.json have any other dependencies? And if there's dependencies in here, it can actually install them. So, you know, you can make it so it's it's pretty smart. So, cold box is in here. But you notice, though, we've got all this extra stuff. This is kind of weird. I'm not sure if I really want that in here um because this is not the pre-built version this is just the zip so if i come in here now and i look at cold box i've got this repo so you know what i don't want 6.2 i want to install cold box at and then i'm going to use forge box now so this is where we get some benefits so if i want version 5 point something i'm like you know what i want 5.0 and i don't want the snapshot i actually want the stable version i can use tab completion and now i can install it now you see it's pulling it down it's actually getting rid of the old cold box and putting the new one because it's using forge box it knows how to uninstall stuff too so now it got rid of the old version so now this is the new version i can see i'm running 5.1 because we always put a little file in there to make it easy the readme should tell you about that as well so we got lots of information in here but all this information is you know more useful now if we look at the box at json we have a version we have a specific version so now if i delete my cold box file here delete it uh, Dang it. Okay. Windows. Just gotta hate it sometimes. So if I just do an install now, what command box is gonna do is look at my box at JSON, install stuff, and you'll see it's installing a gist, a gist, look, looking for cold box, it's unpacking it, but it didn't download it again, right? All these ones, it's downloading, 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 downloading. It didn't download this one again. Now if I want to go back to the six point five point six point two and install it. I download it, decompress it. It's doing its work. It's doing its work. Okay. Now if I do install, because it's not using Forgebox, it doesn't know which version I have. I want that zip. I'm going to go get it. And Command Box is smarter, where it does try to actually do some work, but it's still taking longer to get this stuff. Okay. So now here... What if I want to change to install cold box five? So I don't, maybe I don't want 6.5.6.2. .6 I just want the latest five, whatever, right? Like in here, if I look, this one is, I don't even know which version it is because I downloaded it from a zip and now build process usually puts the numbers in. So that's not going to work. So if I install cold box at five, now I don't have to put the, the exact version. I'll just do this. And now it's going to go install it. And now you'll see it's got cold box five. So what if I want 5.0.1 plus zero, was it? I don't even remember which number it was. 698, I guess I could 5.1.0. Right now, if I save this box at JSON file, I have 5.6.2 in here. If I just do install again now, it's going to go out there. It's going to say, this is the version I want. It's going to say, this isn't the version I want. <laughs> so it gets rid of it, puts in the version I do want, and it's updated. So now I'm like, you know what? Any 5.0 will be cool. I can do 5.0, whatever, and then just put the little carrot in front, and that says anything up to, basically right before version 6, I'm cool with. And so now when I do an install, the Ember range that I've given it tells it, you know what? That's cool. Let's do this. And... It's so fast because command box keeps versions of these packages. It knows this certain package, this version is 5.1 or 5.01 or 5.62 or whatever. It keeps track of all of those. And so you get some speed with that. Okay. I know we're right at the hour or just after it. So um, again, why should we make use command box or forge box? Cause it should make your developer life easier. 
again, gives you speed improvements, know which version you have, um, save you download time because you can build packages. It's not a source control repo of all the history, et cetera, all the bloat. Uh, and you only download it when you have a new version available and only if it's a version that you want to upgrade to. And you only actually install it based on these things, but it only downloads it if it doesn't have that version already in the artifacts directory. So it, Command Box has a local artifacts that it uses. Wait a minute. Hmm. Okay, so what I was supposed to do is have another section here. So this is the code. So let me show you real quickly, guys. I know we're over time, but um, I want to pull up the site. And so we have a, a gist. And you'll see right now that this is just errors, okay? So I want to jump in here and try to figure out why. Now, first of all, which gist is this? This is another reason I don't like using this. It's not that one. It's this one. And if you look at the error, the error says it can't have this component type to a value of a type of SV4. So basically, this little util is supposed to return a type of SV4, but we call it SV4 util, so it doesn't work. So I have to like change this code, which is not good, or in my gist here, which I'm creating a new module here, um, I could rename the file and I could rename it here. So basically just using this here, I'm just going to delete this because it's the easiest way to do it. But again, when you're installing certain things, you got to make sure that they're user friendly. So here I'm leaving everything else the same. So I'm creating a new version of it. And again, ugly name. Right, but that's the, the path to get to it. I'm passing a couple of dummy keys and then I can dump the variable out. So now if I come over here and refresh, you'll see I have that component. It's dumping it out. So I was able to successfully create this component. Now, the trick is, is that you're going to have a whole bunch of nasty folders all over your app, which I hate. Um, again, we can install it. You can tell command box to install it in a different place. Once you've installed it once, you can come in here and tell it where you want to put it. You can do it when you install it. You can tell it the directory you want to put things in. Uh, so it's up to you, but you have to figure out, you know, how you want to run them, right? So we also have a cflib. So if we look at the cflib for git hostname, there's a cfm file. So it's not a cfc. So we, we can't just, you know, instantiate the cfc. We have to include it and then call that function, that UDF. So for that one, we just include the file. So we got to know where it lives and what the name of it is, and then we can we can call it, right? So if we use get host name function with the, the Google stuff here, we can check that out, and that works. And we installed that using, um, you know, command box by just telling it where it was. So cflib, get host name, and see so anything on cflib you can download there. And then if we go back to the jar implementation, so I'm actually going to use bcrypt. Ooh. So I was wrong, Charlie, when I, I had this set up. It doesn't actually recursively check your libs. Uh, let me restart my server real quick. Oh, wait, what is it doing? <laughs> so let me restart my server real quick. So it'll pick up the jar file this time, hopefully. I thought it was recursive, but I guess it's not. No, no, it's not. Oh, so that's even worse. <laughs> there we go. So now I have a bcrypt password tool. So I've just got the jar. And so obviously we have to tell Java settings where all the, the jars live. And now in our file here, I do a create object java and i tell it what the class path is to get it and then here i'm just dumping out a bcrypt.hash password and i'm giving my password don't look don't look at my password and then i'm using bcrypt because it requires a salt so i'm bcrypt.gen salt and i have to basically give it a work factor in here so using two different calls to the same java function but that's how you implement it um and so as you mentioned charlie does command box do things to make it easier no, Coldbox does. Coldbox has a Java loader module that'll help load these modules even easier. And if we actually look at the modules folder, we go and look at um, bcrypt here. There's some stuff in the module config that actually helps set up um, here. See, it actually adds the libpath. 
for where the models lib folder is. It gives a work factor setting. And when you load, it uses wirebops to actually, you know, append these settings and get Java loader set up and load the bcrypt stuff. So it does some work. Um, when Coldbox loads through modules too, it like, it'll go through all these modules. It'll look for all the models. It'll map them. So you can just say, get instance of SendGrid protocol. And it doesn't matter if this is in the top level modules or if it's inside of a module, inside of a module, inside of a module, inside of a module. Coldbox knows where to go find it. But if you're installing something, you know, maybe five layers deep and you change something up here, or maybe someone moves this, right? They move this into, into the lib folder now. Your code's going to break because you just moved it inside the lib folder. But with Coldbox modules, it'll look through every module recursively until it finds it. And so it'll know how to find that library. So, um, you know, Coldbox does a few things. It's not Commandbox doing it, but Commandbox puts things in the place that Coldbox understands. We did it because we were sick of these problems and it kept biting us. So we made conventions. So if you put things in a certain place, it makes life easier for Coldbox. And other frameworks are the same way. You put services for you know framework one in a certain folder. You put models in a certain folder, etc. And so same type of thing. So this just is a way to install things in a certain folder. So anyways, let's get back to this. Get back to this. And if I go slideshow then we should be questioned. And I saw a whole bunch of stuff there, but I know that Scott was answering and Charlie was answering. So Charlie, is there anything I need to answer after you guys' help? Because no, I I you're so. jumping in. <clears throat> nope, that was just some side discussion about Java stuff, Java integration. Okay. Now, okay. while we've got a moment before you might speak, Scott, I had just asked you, Scott and Anthony are going back and forth about, did you share it? What is it? Oh, didn't post. So if Scott, if you're sharing a URL, it might be that that might not post if you share it. But if what Scott meant was he shared his directory list, yeah, that made it. So Scott, it was just a timing thing. At the very moment you shared your directory list, he had asked, what is it? He hadn't seen you'd shared it. So I think, Anthony, if you confirm that you're good with that directory list snippet, it shows on my screen as being at 1210. Yeah, I see it too. Yeah, 10, I don't 10. know if, if yeah. in the YouTube view they see the time entries. Of course, it would be on their own time zone. But anyway, yes. moving back to, <laughs> to Gavin's talk, does anybody have any questions or comments related to that? Yeah, and like I said, I was if I had time, I could show some some cold box stuff. But I know most people here are not cold boxy. But like I said, there are other benefits and you know little <laughs> tricks, and other frameworks do it too. So. But uh, if there are no questions, then I'll, we'll try and wrap this up pretty quick. But I do have uh, another one planned if Charlie's available for the seventh. <laughs> I keep just right. throwing dates at Charlie's and hope, you, hope you're available. Almost always, um, yeah. So, yeah. But for the seventh, so a couple of weeks from now, um, I want to talk about planning and building my developer feud quiz API. And so for that one there, um, we built, we did an API session a while ago, sort of, you know, cold fusion APIs. So this one's gonna be using some cold boxy tools. Cause when I did that last session, everyone's like, well, how do you do it? I'm like, no, the, not, not using any of these tools. So this one I'm actually using cold box. We're using quick, we're using swagger API documentation. We're doing stuff that the way I build things every day. And so, um, in Adobe developer week, I'm actually presenting about building the developer feud quiz type game. And we'll be showing how to deploy that to Quasar and, and you know, different Vue.js um, versions. And that's going to be kind of fun. But I thought I'd show you guys how I'm building the API for it as that sort of step. So um, we'll do that there. And there's a bunch of links here as well for, for people. So Cool. Okay, I thought well, again. saw my throwing my hands up there. That wasn't me trying to get Gavin's attention. As I told him just before our session, I found a tick crawling on me. <laughs> I keep feeling like hey, it's another one. I had a, we had a big storm last night and I had a bunch of trees down on my property and they were covering a road that goes to a property beyond me. And it's my responsibility to keep that road clear. So I had to get out there with a chainsaw and got ticks on me. So yeah. So okay. Well, hopefully people get something out of this. You know, like just even though it's sort of a walkthrough of uh, the different things and over time the the pain points we've seen and you know try to try to make our lives easier as developers and that's why we built tools like command box and forge box and um like i said you don't have to use forge box with command box but hopefully you can see some of the benefits and remember 
doesn't have to be a box product to be put up on Forgebox. There's a lot of cool things up there, and you can put your own up there, and it's free to post stuff. The storage is included for free and everything. Um, you even get one private package free. But if you want to have your whole bunch of private stuff on there, there's you know paid accounts for that. Um, and you know, but there are options. So I have clients that still we have you know get SSH stuff. Basically, they have all their stuff in private GitLab repos, premise on premise stuff, and we still use that just makes the build slow because we got to download the zips every time. And I keep telling them, I was like, you want to use that Forgebox account we got for you? And we're, we're getting them moved over because they're just sick of build time speeds. And anyway, so hopefully everybody got something out of it. And remember the last two sessions are up on the, the YouTube channel um, with Charlie and all the other 296 episodes. So yeah, but thanks everybody for having me. And again, sorry for the technical difficulties and going a little long here. But no, I mean, this is actually right at about the time, uh, about 70 minutes that the last one did. So we're cool. Um, I want to ask a question while I was distracted with the conversation in the chat. When you were talking about Forgebox, um, didn't the I can't remember if it was the first or a previous talk of yours talk about somebody putting their code into Forgebox? Or no, that yeah, was so another talk you did. A, yeah, so I have some CF um, yeah, uh, webinars up on CF Cast. So go. it was like boxification. There is that um, link to CF Cast here. So if we go to series, there's a free series. Publish your first Forgebox package, and it basically walks you through all the steps. What is Forgebox? Why should I use it? More about Forgebox and different account options. Looking at the site, you know how to create an account. You need an account to post. Um, you don't have to pay, but you need an account. Um, you can download and use it for free, though. So you don't have to, like, basically sign up an account to download stuff. You just need to sign up an account if you're going to publish stuff. Um, we talked about how to use the CLI to create an account, how to create one online using the website, what the minimum requirements for a package is, uh, what happens if your slug isn't unique, because you have to have a slug name that is unique, um, you know, using package commands, how to publish a package by the CLI, how to use it by the website, you know, really small. They're like a couple of minutes each. Uh, most of them is a few longer ones, but they're short snippets. So if you want to play with Forgebox, this is a good one. And these are all free. So freely available for you guys to go learn about, you know, creating your own package. And there's actually another one coming up uh, next week. Yep. And there's a couple more coming soon too. But basically this series is almost done. So in the next series, we're going to be um, boxing Boxification of uh, third-party libraries. I'm going to be doing some Ben Adele stuff and actually putting them into Forgebox and everything. Um, so, yeah. And Anthony says he'd love to learn Coldbox. And if, if you actually uh, sign up, there is a series on here. It's like one of, uh, one of our workshops. So if you sign up for, like, I think it's 25 bucks a month or something, you get all the content in here. And um, some of them are actually workshops like Up and Running with Quick, which is a workshop. And, you know, people pay a lot of money to take these workshops in person, but you can do them here. Command Box, Zero to Hero. There's a Cold Box, Zero to Hero. And so, like, so usually that's, a, you know, got a decent decent price tag, right, if you want to just buy them one off. But if you're, if you're a registered member, you can get them. You can learn about object oriented programming. It's a lot of cool stuff on here. Um, and we're adding more all the time, free and paid. So... But the registration gets you all of that, and you'll get uh, a lot of good stuff coming soon. ITP videos from last year, the previous years are on here. So if you guys are thinking about Into the Box, we got videos from 2020, 2021, LATAM, and like last year's Into the Box, is a, quite a few of them are free. So if you want to go check out some of those for free, do that. Uh, and hopefully it'll convince you to come to the conference too. So cool. sales pitch over. Yeah, no, very cool. <laughs> and I just, I mean, I know this talk was about leveraging and using packages, but I just, I didn't know if you might have mentioned while you were talking about Forgebox how you had done such a talk on putting no. stuff in there. So, no, but, that's a good point. But yeah, this, this, like I said, this is a lot of stuff and trying to, trying to share more about it because like I said a lot of people yeah. don't realize some of the yeah. things you can do with Command Box or Forgebox and the Dynamic yeah. Box user. Obviously, we'd like you to, to use some of our box products, but at the end of the day, you know, use what makes you a better developer and makes your life easier. And if that's some of our tools, cool. If not, that's fine too. But, you know, we just want to share and educate, you know. And again, we're using them and we built them because of all the pain points we had. You know, a lot of people left Cold Fusion in 2012 because we didn't have a CLI. We didn't have embedded servers. We didn't have a good testing, you know, suite. 
and so we've tried to you know fill some of those gaps and you know and help help the language and the community evolve and so and it is awesome that's what you guys have done thank you for that so yeah like if we work together as a community uh we'll be good so quick quick is an orm an object relational mapper uh, it's written in cold fusion it's really easy it's like hibernate but less uh java <laughs> but uh but yeah so there's some videos on that this session's coming up at uh end of the box and i said if you come and look at um my next session planning and building my developer few quiz api you'll see some of the quick orm stuff in there basically it's a cfc that knows more about how your database works and does a lot of crud for you so you don't have to write a lot of queries it'll do a lot of it for you and uh yeah make your life easier so. and again it doesn't presume you're using cold box Quick does QB, oh, okay. which is the query builder, is uh, is not a cold box thing. But Quick ties into all sorts of uh, interceptors and all sorts of crazy stuff. Cold box does, uh, but QB uh, is a you know a query builder. It makes even James Moberg, who doesn't use box products, is using QB uh, for his some non box uh, things because it just makes he said it makes the CF query tag look annoying. Because <laughs> so even he sees some value in it. So but yeah, query builder. Uh, is the non cold box specific version quick is uh, cold box and I think someone's trying to make quick work outside of cold box for see if wheels or framework one or something Maybe that's um, I yeah I mean it's it's possible to just again cold box does a few things that so you don't have to so if yeah. you're doing a lot of the cold box modules elsewhere you have to uh you know you have to basically do some of that yourself so hey cool you're there oh James Marburg is here hey, hey, James, James. There. thanks James Cool. So um, about Anthony's question, okay, well, sorry, QB, er, Q... <laughs> autocorrect, I was wondering, yeah, QB is pretty awesome. QB, yeah. there you go, okay, yeah. yeah. Um, quick is like QB on steroids. There you, so. go. There you go. <laughs> now to Anthony's having raised that, I'll just make the point that that would suggest to me that he hasn't been watching the Modernizer Die podcast because it's mentioned at least every few episodes in some way. So yeah. check that out if you haven't seen it before check out the modernizer die it's right there the uh, second link from the bottom on his screen currently and that's uh you know primarily an ordis organized and run podcast and gavin is by and large the producer and usually the uh, most of the time i'm the host yeah right but he has sometimes has others and sometimes they do have non ordis people but the bigger point is they don't just talk about order stuff they talk yeah. about all kinds of stuff having to do with cold fusion it's a wonderful resource and i'm just saying anybody here listening to the meetup if you're not listening to the modern hours die podcast you should it's a weekly podcast they cover what's going on in events they cover what's going on in recent blog posts and uh, yep. up, uh engine updates security engine fixes updates, August, everything yeah, yeah. so yeah. everybody everybody in the cf and lucy world should be listening you know, if you want to be up to date or if you just, you know, if you're out mowing your lawn or out for a jog or taking a bath, listen to the yeah. fuck. <laughs> I mean, part of the reason when we built it is because I didn't even know what half the things the exactly. audits team were doing because there was so much order stuff. I'm like, let alone the rest of the community. So it helps me get educated and we try and share it out. And so, I mean, if you go to the, if we look at this link here, I mean, you can just look at the show notes. We, we have pretty detailed show notes. So if you come up to, like this last episode, for example, you know, we talk about all the different things, you know, so into the box updates. All right. Uh, so if speakers. nothing else, everybody, you should be checking out those show notes after each episode. You'll be amazed yep. at what you learn. All right. So updates like the Galaxy blog, uh, mail, mail gun support, you know, different meetups like this meetup in case you missed it for different things as well. Uh, tonight, there's actually a Seattle Cold Fusion meetup as well. If you guys are watching now, check that out tonight at 5 p.m. Uh, Pacific time. Uh, Adobe workshops that are coming up and everything. Um, yeah, so a lot of good stuff. All the CF cast content that we've released this week. You know, upcoming conferences. And they're not just CF Mail, they're CF Mail related. So like right. Quasar, Vue.js, WDEL Developer Week, that conference, Into the Box, CF Summit. You know, so we, we try and keep track of everything. And then we run down all the blogs and tweets and videos and you know podcasts and, and all sorts of stuff so it's there's a ton of stuff there we yeah like i said we're just trying to share and get that information out there and hopefully somebody will find something new and learn and 
yeah, you know, make the community stronger. So absolutely, it's great. And that's all um, we should mention in case anybody doesn't know about it that you guys are now also doing a blog post where you do highlight weekly stuff changing in the orders world. And so anybody that's involved in that, if you haven't learned about that, get onto that blog and get onto its feed because you want to know about that. Yep. We're just trying to get information out there because let's say it's hot enough for our own team to figure out what's going on. Yeah. So yeah. so one last thing, um, unless anybody else comes up with any question or comment, uh, Scott had made a comment earlier about episode 300. Yep. So this is 297. Um, I'm going to try to do one next week, which would be 298. I haven't announced it yet. And then yours would, the next one would be 299. So then that would make 300 come up after that. And I'm thinking about, you know, what might we do for that? You know, it might, it, it's probably going to be something special and not just another talk. So, well, you know what's happening right after that session? It's W Developer Week. So maybe you can get something going with that. Who knows? Right. And I'm not averse to that, but, you know, conversely, I'm yeah. not going to tie it to any particular topic is, you know, I haven't really given it too much thought because it's still a couple weeks away. And of course, there's no date for these, you know, 300 could be three or four or five weeks from now. Um, it just depends on how many talks we have between now and then. But yeah, yeah. I mean, I did something different for 200 and I might do something different for 300. So thank yeah, you. Yeah, I was thinking it might be kind of nice to look at, you know, look at all the different sessions exactly. you, you've yeah. talked about the how it started and everything before and yeah. you know like it might be kind of interesting to see how many different speakers you've had and you know yes and, things and like stuff. that and, exactly yeah it's, it's, it'll, be, it'll be really cool episodes it could take some time so yeah that's, so maybe so what time thinking about doing something like that yes yes yeah. when you when you find some time <laughs> right 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 but you know once i once i see it the train is coming then i will definitely get on or off the track or whatever the analogy calls for but, uh, cool. Yeah. Well, I'm going to upload uh, upload the repo, upload my slides here as Sweet. well, and I'll, I'll make that available to Charlie, and he'll add to the notes. And uh, But, yeah, thanks, everybody, for joining me. I really appreciate it. You guys have a great day, and uh, we'll see you again in a few weeks. Thank you, sir. So long, everybody.